Hello, welcome back. We're now going to do another describing function calculation and this is going to be a bit more indicative of how describing function calculations normally go and that is they get messy. Unfortunately, um, calculating describing functions is generally just a, a real pain. Um, there's no other way uh, to say it. Um, I want to do an example just so that you can we can just sort of go through the steps in a slightly more complicated setting uh, but be prepared for a kind of a mess of integration. Um, you can sort of get a clue uh, for how much of a mess things are going to get. So I've already got a lot on my board and that's because I have attempted to do this calculation and I messed it up. Um, so it can happen to anyone you just got to be super careful. So be, the, the message here is describing function calculations can be messy. You've got to be really careful. Um, I was a bit embarrassed to, to mess up the calculation, but uh, I don't feel so bad actually because um, the calculation um, was wrong in the set of lecture notes that I inherited. So uh, professors make the same mistake and I don't know how many generations of Lund University students have been presented the, an incorrect describing function calculation for the saturation nonlinearity, but uh, we're going to get it right today. Hopefully I'm going to keep doing takes until, uh, until I get there. So um, the nonlinearity that we're going to look at today is the saturation function. Um, so uh, that's the function I've sketched here. And so what does the saturation do? Um, well, if you input a value of y that is between minus 1 and 1, it just outputs the same thing. So in for small values of y, the nonlinearity doesn't do anything. It just returns whatever you put in. However, if you put in values of y that are bigger than 1 or smaller than minus 1, the output saturates. And, and in this case, it's saturating at the value of 1. Um, so if we put in a value of y is equal to 2, the output is 1, 3, 1. So anything larger than 1, it outputs 1. And saturations are commonly used to describe like limits in uh, the strength of motors or anything where there's like a hard threshold in um, how much force something can apply, how much capacity something has. Uh, this is the kind of nonlinearity you use to describe that effect. It's an extremely common type of uh, nonlinearity. Doesn't look much more complicated than the relay that we saw before, but boy, is it going to make our life um, harder. And so we're going to do the describing function calculation. So we need to remember the definition for uh, Fourier coefficients. Um, and we're also going to need a few trig identities. So here we have cos of sine to the minus 1 of x is the square root of 1 minus x squared. And also sine of 2 times sine minus 1 of x is equal to 2x times the square root of 1 minus x squared. I'm not going to justify these. Um, if you want a little challenge, you can have a little look at this picture here where we have a unit circle. Uh, this length here is x, and these two angles in the triangle um, are equal to each other. Can you use this picture to derive these identities? Um, so a little bonus challenge for you, if you like. And um, uh, this is also giving us some clue. I mean, we could already guess that we'd be dealing with lots of trig identities and um, trig integrals uh, just because we're computing Fourier coefficients and there's sines and cosines all over the place. So you need to have your kind of full uh, toolkit of uh, tips and tricks for getting through cosine integrals and sine integrals. Um, so what are we trying to do? We're trying to calculate this thing called the describing function. And this was equal to b1 plus j times a1 all over a, uh, where um, b1 and a1, these are the Fourier coefficients of this signal e of t. And what is e of t? Well, e of t is the output from the nonlinearity when you input um, a sine wave at times uh, with amplitude a. So this was our placeholder for this limit cycle. This is our approximation of the limit cycle with amplitude a and frequency omega. And a1 and b1 are just the first Fourier coefficients um, that you get um, when you look at what e of t must be under this particular input. Um, so this is what we're trying to find. Um, and now we just need to do it. So let's get on with it. But um, there's a kind of a few little tips that we can use to uh, make our life a little bit easier. And the first, this is something that we saw last time. So if the nonlinearity is static and odd, so that means h of y is equal to minus h of minus y, 
um, this implies that a1 is equal to 0. And this actually implies that all of the a Fourier coefficients would be equal to 0. Uh, this is just a nice little uh, trick to have in the back of your mind, because uh, you very often deal with odd um, nonlinearities. And if you have this, then you know you can throw away a1. So we've already made some progress. Uh, so this is equal to b1 over a in our case. So the problem, all that remains is to find b1. Well, what are some other tips? Um, something that makes all of these Fourier um, integrals a little bit easier is a, a time normalization. And in particular, it really helps to set t is equal to phi over omega. So what we're going to do is get, we're going to replace all of our instances with time with um, a variable phi instead. Um, so uh, the first thing that um, this could help uh, help with is um, so we know that the period of our sine wave was equal to 2 pi over omega. So um, when written in these new coordinates, we end up with sine waves with period phi. So maybe that's even easier to see up here. So in the variable phi, our trial signal is just a sine of phi. So t omega is equal to phi. And the, the main other things that it does is it simplifies all of these um, integrals here. So we get e of phi. So in, rather than you know, we input now this signal, which is a function of phi, and we get e of phi. And then we have to multiply it by sine of phi. And we want to use d phi. But dt is equal to d phi over omega. So this is divided by omega. But t times omega is just equal to uh, 2 pi. So um, this becomes 2 pi, or equivalently, 1 over pi. And similarly, uh, when we substitute in for our limits of integration, um, so t going from 0 to t is the same as phi going from 0 to 2 pi. And you don't have to make these changes. Um, so after, after all this is said and done, is we, we can use b1 is equal to 1 over pi integral 2 pi, so between 0 and 2 pi, of e of phi sine phi d phi, which is just a little bit simpler. Um, I don't know if you remember when we did the integrals involving the relay, uh, we had to um, we, we had to make sure that we kept track of all the t's over omegas. And at the end, they all cancelled out, and our describing function didn't uh, depend on them. Um, so um, we can alternatively just get all of those cancellations out the way at the beginning and write everything in terms of phi. So that's uh, what this little trick does. And our final tip um, is to just draw out e of phi and split. Uh, into regions. And what this means will become clear when we do it. But uh, typically, when you deal with describing functions, uh, on some region, your uh, e of phi follows one functional form. On another region, it follows another. And what you want to do is split e of phi up and then do your integration over these regions one at a time. Uh, that will, this will become a bit clearer. Um, so, But let's start to follow that tip and just draw out what e of phi must be. So here we have phi. Our input is a times sine of phi. So y of phi looks like this. This is 2 pi. Um, and now, uh, yeah, that's a. And so what does e of phi look like? Well. Let's just assume that a is bigger than 1 for now. So let's say 1 is here. Well, when we input small values, we just get back what we put in. So e of phi looks like sine of a sine phi to begin with. 
then it saturates out. So when the input gets too big, it just returns a value of one. And then the same thing happens, but for the negative part, and you get something like that. So this is what E of uh, phi looks like if a is bigger than 1. Well, what does e of phi look like if a is less than or equal to 1? Well, e of phi is just equal to a sine phi. And what is the Fourier series of a sine phi? Well, that b1 is still equal to 0, and a1 is equal to a. And so we can begin to actually calculate this guy here. So if a is less than or equal to 1, then b1 is just equal to a, and so our describing function is equal to 1. Um, and to finish things off, we just need to find what b1 is equal to for our values of a bigger than 1. Uh, but unfortunately, this is where things start to get messy. Um, so what do we need to find? We need to find 1 over pi integral from 0 to 2 pi of e of phi multiplied by sine phi. And so just like before, it's sort of helpful to try and sketch out what we think this function is going to look like. Um, well, we kind of, um, we're kind of getting close. So here we have e of phi, here we have sine of phi uh, is scaled by a factor of a. And um, what's a convenient way that we could split this up? Well, just like when we did the relay, we noticed that e of phi is negative exactly when sine phi is negative. So the product of e of phi of sine of phi is just going to mirror the product of e of phi sine of phi on this region. So we can just double the integral from 0 to pi, and that will give us the same as the integral from 0 to 2 pi. We can actually do a little bit better, because we see we have this symmetry as well. So whatever we integrate from here to here will be equal to whatever we integrate from here to here. So we can just do four times this integral. So that's our first observation, um, is that b1 is equal to 4 over pi integral pi over 2 to 0, uh, uh, 0 to pi over 2 of e of phi sine phi d phi. And now let's just split this into two regions corresponding to the... So we have e of phi is following one form on this region and another form on this region. So let's just break up our integral. Um, so what do we get? So this is equal to 4 over pi. And now integral, let's call this point here phi 1. So 0 to phi 1. And what does e of phi on this region? Well, it's just a sine phi. So this is a sine phi. This is what e of phi is equal to on this region here. And that's multiplied by sine phi d phi. And then we have to add on the integral from phi to pi over 2. And what is e of phi equal to on this region? It's just equal to 1. So the integral we have to do is sine phi d phi. Fine, we're making some progress. But this is where the mess starts. You can already see it coming. Here we've got a sine squared coming. These are never fun to integrate. Um, and you're free to use whatever method you like here. You could turn things into complex numbers and integrate that way. Um, we're going to proceed by using the double angle formula. So we're going to continue. Um, so we've now got 4 over pi. And this is now our first integral is 0 to phi 1. And we've got We'll pull out our a, and then we've got sine squared. And sine squared is equal to a half of 1 minus cos 2 phi d phi. And then our second integral, well, this is just sine. So let's just get on with it and start doing that. So that's the integral of sine is minus cos. So that's minus cos of phi. And we're evaluating it between phi 1 
and pi over 2. So we just keep on plugging away um, and we have now 4 over pi and now let's just do this integral so that's a and we can also pull out our half and then the integral of 1 is just phi the integral of minus cos 2 phi is minus sine 2 phi all over 2 and this is evaluated between 0 and phi 1 and what do we get here so well cos of pi over 2 is just 0 so this whole thing is plus cos of phi 1 and we got some brackets there and brackets there so we're getting there uh, next line this is equal to 4 over pi and then we have a over 2 and then what do we have in here we have phi 1 minus a half of sine um, 2 phi 1 plus cos phi 1 okay we are getting close um, now it's time to make use of our trig identities here and yeah so let's find out what phi 1 is equal to so let's sort of zoom in on this part of our figure and what do we get well we're phi 1 is the point at which a sine of phi is equal to 1 so this curve here we've got phi this is a sine phi so phi 1 is given by this equation so it's 1 is equal to a sine phi 1 so it's the value of phi for which a sine phi is equal to 1 and so that implies that phi 1 is equal to sine to the minus 1 of 1 over a and now you see why we need these um, inverse uh, um, the, all these these funky formula uh, formulae here um, so what do we get well I'm a bit afraid of simplifying things too soon so I'm just going to keep going we're going to have 4 pi and then we have a over 2 and then phi 1 is just sine to the minus 1 of 1 over a what is minus a half of sine of 2 of phi of 1 so sine of 2 phi 1 so phi 1 is equal to sine of 1 over a so here x is equal to 1 over a so this thing here is equal to 2 times 1 over a square root 1 minus 1 over a squared but we've got a half of them so this thing here this is just equal to minus 1 over a square root 1 minus 1 over a squared um, and then here what do we have we have a plus and we have our other one we have cos of sine to the minus 1 of 1 over a so this is equal to square root of 1 minus 1 over a squared now we need to start simplifying um, so what do we get we get uh, okay let's just do the first term here this is equal to 2 a over pi and then we have sine to the minus 1 of 1 over a and then here we have an a over 2 and a 1 over a and here we have a plus 1 so actually when we simplify this we get plus um, a over 2 I should never so we, we've got plus 4 pi multiplied by a over 2 um, no no 1 over 2 square root of 1 minus 1 
over a squared. That's that's right. Yeah, so that then that cancels with that to give us a two. And this is our expression, and I'll try and shove it up here. So the describing function when a is greater than 1 is equal to 2a over pi sine to the minus 1, 1 over a, plus, and then here we had 2 over pi, and then square root 1 minus 1 over a squared. And that, I believe, is um, almost the answer. This is b1, so b1 divided by a. Well, that cancels out, and we end up with a 2, and we end up with a 1 over a there. So this is our describing function in this case. So, yeah. Um, not too bad, perhaps, but I mean, this is fairly typical, I'm afraid, of how a describing function calculation would go. Uh, follow th these tips, find your function a, um, e of phi, and then split your integral up into regions and use as much symmetry as you can to simplify things, and then just uh, try not to make any mistakes as you go. So um, there you go, a more complicated describing function example.